carbon dioxide. So there's lots of other waste removal systems in the body. This is specifically focusing on getting rid of these nitrogen wastes, urea, uric acid, and creatinine. Creatinine is creatine phosphate, which is rich ATP. Because then the better remembers A and P1. What is under amino acid? The breakdown of amino acid? Mm. As in deamination. See, previous topic. <coughs> in order to work, the kidneys have to have a certain blood pressure. And they're going to do that in part by maintaining <coughs> a constant blood volume. Somebody tell me something about aldosterone. Phosphorine in blood or sodium. It's got sodium in it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do the adrenal cortex. That's the source. That's my test. We're going to go to the kidneys. We're going to tell the kidneys to retain sodium. Retains, what does that got to do with blood volume? I'm going to retain sodium, I retain chloride, and then I retain water. Sodium by itself doesn't do it. I'm sure you go through all the steps. If I retain sodium, I retain chloride, which means I retain water. Who's his antagonist? <coughs> what was the stimulus? What causes the release of aldosterone? Low sodium. High sodium. Mm -hmm. What causes the release of angiotensin? I didn't plan on this. What causes the release of oh, quinine? Right. <laughs> if we want to retain sodium, we had a lack of sodium in the bloodstream. Hey, that's the first triple A. Who's this antagonist? Who's the antagonist to aldosterone? Page three of your notes. Long ago, when you were mere slips of youths. Is it ADH? Nope. Nope. He's not the antagonist. A and P. A and P or A and F, atrial and atriuretic factors. Okay. He's going to come from the heart. Oh, oh, we're doing that, sorry. Here when there's too it. much there we blood go. pressure, you're working me too hard. So I'm going to go to the kidneys also. And I'm going to tell the kidneys. Bless you, you the child sodium. of God. If I lose the sodium, I lose the chloride. If I lose the chloride, I drop the <coughs> Okay. Now, third guy is ADH. How is he different? How is this? How is this hormone different from any other hormone? <coughs> First off, we 
Where's it come from? The heart. The heart. Hypothalamus. I need it. Via the posterior pituitary. It's coming around to bite you guys. ADH comes out of the hypothalamus through the posterior pituitary. ADH is going to go to the kidneys. And what's it going to tell the kidneys to do? I'm going to shoot anybody that says sodium. How's that for, I mean, who's taking it? Right, they're going to retain, retain. Remember, the hypothalamus is listening to dehydration. Okay, so second, we're all the way up to the second function. We filled the board. The second function <coughs> is constant blood volume. The kidneys aren't going to work if you don't give them enough fluid to function. One of the fastest ways to die is for your kidneys to not have enough fluid to work. They shut down and you tend to die afterwards. Look, they're, they're clustering. <laughs> now, somebody said, and it's true, a third function. Right along with these guys, a third function. blood pressure. So yes, Andrew, manipulating the AAA hormones again are going to affect blood volume. But what's the fourth hormone related to the kidneys that affects blood pressure? <coughs> hmm? EPO. Ooh. How does EPO affect blood pressure? He increases red blood cell it production. It increases your red blood cells, which Ooh. increases blood viscosity. viscosity, which raises your blood pressure. Good. It's all for us all yet. <laughs> now that reminds us that another function for the urinary system is that it's an endocrine structure. Kidneys are an endocrine structure. <coughs> So two of the hormones produced by the kidneys are who are the two? Somebody read the board. <laughs> who are the two hormones produced by a kidney? Hmm? One is renin. Renin is going to be released by the kidneys when it senses a lack in sodium or a lack in blood pressure. What is running going to do for a living? Uh, Manifa, you told me before. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 uh, no sympathy, I'm ahead of you. <laughs> kind of thing. Renin activates angiotensinogen to become angiotensin. Angiotensin and C number two. Kind of thing. Okay? What's the other hormone? Thank you. 
Kill some tuna. Kill some tuna. Oh, great. No. 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 That was a 50 50 chance. It's going to be parathyroid hormone. And where, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no. Calcitonin only goes to the bones. So parathyroid hormone is the only one that's going to go to the kidneys. blood pH. If there's too many hydrogens in the bloodstream, we're going to throw the hydrogens out into the urine. If there's not enough hydrogen ions in the bloodstream, we're going to pull hydrogen out of the urine and put it back into the bloodstream. So pH. Remember, pH is balancing hydrogen ions. out of the bloodstream. Uh, we're going to fill, uh, excuse, I don't want to fall. We're going to filter the blood of things like medications. Anything that the body considers a foreign substance. We're going to filter out alcohols, medications. We're going to get rid of excess hormones. store protein, so that you're actively muscle building. That's like what exercise is made. The protein just goes right through. And then last but not least, the kidneys and gluconeogenesis. What does that mean? We're going to make new glucose out of what? Glucose. <laughs> Fats and fats or proteins. I can make it out of a non-carbohydrate source. Okay. Speaking of making things out of other things, what was the name of the dwarf that can spin a straw into gold? I'm so I am so impressed. <laughs> okay. What? Okay. Now, I just finished asking A and B. I was just asking A and P, just to reassure myself. A and P won. First question on the exam, one that I start almost every class with. What are the four general tissue types in the body? The four general tissue types in the body. Okay. Hyaline, part, nerve tissue, connective tissue, epithelial, epithelial, muscle, and muscle. I got it. <laughs> These will be the next your competition in the next class of whatever you go into, guys. And we'll get to stuff. Okay. So feel comfortable then. Let's go back then and take a look at structure. We start by taking a look at a kidney. And there's two of them. We're going to find that the kidneys are, first off, retroperitoneal. That means that they're outside of the peritoneum's membrane. They're not part of the, small, the intestinal system. And I'm not sure who's protecting who. But what it means is that an infection of peritonitis isn't going to bother the kidneys. 
the kidneys, on the other hand, are isolated, and any infection in the kidneys doesn't readily get into the intestines. They're outside the peritoneal system, so they're retroperitoneal. They're going to be pretty high up, somewhere between T12 and L3, which means they're going to be protected by the false ribs. going to be held in place by three layers, by an outer fascia, his job is simply to hold the kidneys close to any other organs in the body, they're close to nearby muscles, etc. is where we have microscopic units called necrons. Each kidney has about a million necrons. I actually knew the person that counted. It's all the depressing. <laughs> necrons are the microscopic structures that actually produce the urine. So their job is to produce the urine. That urine, once it's produced, gets filtered into these converging tubes. It all gets filtered into these converging tubes that look to someone like pyramids. So this middle layer of the kidney is referred to as the medulla, and it has a whole lot of structures that are called pyramids. Pyramids are is really collecting things. And then the center of a kidney is hollow. <coughs> the center of the kidney is called a pelvis, and he's going to lead out into a ureter. in the nephrons specifically, drains out through the medulla, through the pyramids, and then leaves the kidney via this big empty cavity called the pelvis. Okay, somebody was just, yes, aha, okay, this is a test. The ureters, we've got two ureters. Ureter is a typical yeah. Both sides of the um, medulla is the medulla is the area with all the pyramids in it. And then which one is the cortex? Cortex is the outer portion. Mm -hmm. So cortex, medulla, pyramid. <coughs> what are the pyramids? Those are the collecting ducts that are collecting the urine. Tissue 
to make up the area. It's a typical body tube. All body tubes have an inner layer of what tissue? What tissue? Remember our four general tissue groups? Yeah. Epithelial. Okay. What type of epithelial is, and this is an AV1 question, is unique to the urinary system? No. Okay. A typical body tube is going to have an inner layer of epithelium. The one that continues into all of them. There you go. Transitional epithelium. The only place in the body for transitional epithelium is the urinary system. The only place in the body for pseudostratified ciliated blah, 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 is the respiratory system. Okay? So we have an inner layer of epithelium, and in this case, it's transitional epithelium. The next layer, the middle layer, is always muscle. Now, if I tell you that the urine <coughs> is capable of peristalsis, what are three things you can tell me about this muscle layer? It's going to have circular and longitudinal. That's one thing. It's smooth muscle. And what's the third thing? What's the third thing about anything that's capable of peristalsis? Who controls it? The autonomic nervous system. In this case, stress, the sympathetic nervous system, is going to slow urine production because you don't need to be dribbling while you're running away from the elephant. Okay? And then the parasympathetic will increase your urine production back to normal. So again, stress, sympathetic, doesn't always mean it's faster. In this case, it means you want to slow it down. Okay? So a typical body tube has an inner epithelial, a middle muscle, and an outer connective tissue. And that's just for protection and for attachment. Favorite questions. What is a tube capable of peristalsis all about? What's a typical body tube made up of? my two kidneys, they're going to come down through the ureters till we get to a bladder. Now what's interesting is that the ureters come behind the bladder and they empty into the bottom. But first let's take a look at a bladder. Bladder has rugae. What does that tell us about a function for bladder? It's the holes that allow you to expand. So the job of the bladder is simply storage. So you don't have too much of an effect on your social life. It's going to be lined with the same transitional epithelium. That also implies that it can expand his job as storage. But then the third thing that's interesting about the bladder is instead of having the typical two muscle layers, it has a third muscle layer. So it has longitudinal, it has circular, and it has diagonal. So this muscle layer is made up of circular, longitudinal, and diagonal muscle fibers, which are going to ensure that it empties sakes, we wouldn't want our bladder to be peristaltic and have the urine chug up and down, up and down. We want to make sure that it starts at the top and diagonally squeezes and empties out. But these three layers are not like an onion where you can take layers off. These three sets of fibers interweave with each other and make a single muscle that has its own name. It's called a detrusor muscle. So the muscle wall of a bladder is called the detrusor muscle. It is made up 
So I have the two ureters emptying into the bottom of the bladder, and then the bladder itself is going to empty out through a urethra. Single urethra. But before we get to that, the floor of the bladder has a triangular structure that's made up of the two ureters and the urethral opening. In this area, this triangle is called a trigony or trigone. I don't know how we pronounce it. But it's a hardened area at the base of the bladder. Not terribly hard. It's sort of like when you go to the liquor store and you're buying a couple of bottles that have this little piece of cardboard at the bottom to reinforce the base. That's what the trigony is like. It's just a, it's a thicker base to help support the whole bladder. The trigony has two important clinical functions to it, though. Number one, because it's denser, when you do a sonogram, you can see the detrusor, you can see the trigony because it's a thicker object. It tells you as a landmark where you are. Secondly, when a person empties their bladder, they often leave a film of urine right at the bottom of the bladder. Very rarely do we completely empty the bladder. Urine is a wonderful medium for bacteria. People who tend to not completely empty the bladder end up having a nice little nutrient culture growing right here at the base of their bladder. So the trigony is often a place where you have you harbor bacteria <coughs> and have recurrent infections. So a person has a bladder infection, takes antibiotic, goes away, and comes back. Take an antibiotic, goes away, comes back. It's because we never got completely rid of the bacteria that are sitting in the bottom of the bladder. And sometimes if we have to, and it, it's not only the fact that the trigony has this nice film of urine, but also the folds make it more difficult. So what you'll have to do is you literally you go in and you scrape the lining of the bladder to get rid of that outer layer of epithelial tissue in hopes of getting out any residual bacteria sometimes. This is after a course of a couple of antibiotics can't just keep doing that, so you have to be worried because you don't want the pathogen to move up the ureters and affect the kidneys. So you have to deal with it all. But anyway, so the trigony is this floor of the bladder. Last but not least, we have a urethra, another typical body tube capable of peristalsis. Next time you have nothing better to do, you can watch your urine flow and realize that it comes in waves. It is capable of peristalsis. The urethra is sexually dimorphic. Dimorphic means it comes in two kinds, and the variation is between males and females. Okay. The male urethra is going to be longer, and it deals with both urine and sperm. The female urethra is shorter and deals only with urine. So now we can do a north a morsel of nitrogen waste starting all the way up in the cortex, coming through the pyramids of the medulla, coming through the pelvis, through the ureter, through the bladder, through the urethra, to the light blue blue line. So let's go back and see how urine is actually made. And for that, we have to go back and look at our kidney in a little more detail. to 
from the aorta to what? Please anyone has a hand. Blood flow to the kidney comes out of the aorta, goes through what blood vessel? Ring artery. Better be ring artery. So I'm going to come in to the renal artery. Once the renal artery penetrates the kidney, it splits into about five branches that go all the way out to the medulla. And these are called the interlobar arteries. Once the arteries are in the cortex, they dead end and they move to the left or right. And these are called arcuate arteries. And coming off the arcuate arteries, you're going to see little microscopic arteries called radiating arteries. So, and I'm a morsel of blood coming into a kidney. I come from the aorta. I go into a renal artery. I go into an interlobar. the delivery system. Then the blood's going to start circulating around the nephron, which we'll hold on to a second. So we'll leave it here. We're going to circulate around a nephron. And when we finish getting cleaned and getting chemically balanced and all the other things that the kidney's going to do to us. We're going to come out of the kidney just following the same pathway out. When I finish the nephron, I'm going to come out through a radial arteries, which are going to then collect into arcuate, I'm sorry, veins, into arcuate veins, into rate, oh, here we go, into lobar veins, into a renal vein. So I'm just going to run the tape back here. I'm going to come out of the nephron as a radiating vein. Go into an arcuate. of your blood is in a kidney, which is an extraordinary amount considering kidneys are only a, a fist size organ. Six percent of your blood is sitting in a kidney at any given time. So what we need to do is go back and take a look at what's happening in a nephron. Big diagram. They are basically 
basically a tube of, sim of simple epithelium. As soon as we hear simple epithelium, we know this is a tube that's designed for exchange. A nephron looks like a snake that tried to bite a wall. into a tube that other nephrons are draining into as well, called the collecting duct. Urine is going to start in the Bowman's capsule, move through the proximal convoluted tubule, descend, descend, certain contact spots for exchange to happen. So we have a nephron, it's an epithelial tube. The fluid in the nephron is urine. It's actually officially called filtrate until it gets to the collecting duct, but we'll call it urine. But it is like food in the alimentary tract, considered out of the body. So when we want to throw things out, we're putting it into the nephron. Sense of direction is important here. Now, when last seen in the blood vessels, we had come into the kidney to a radiate artery. So here's my radiate artery. The radiate artery is going to give rise to a blood vessel that's called an afferent arteriole. important that it's an arteriole, because remember arterioles can change their diameter. The afferent arteriole goes right into the center of that catcher's bin and makes a capillary bed that looks a lot like a baseball. <coughs> this is highly technical diagram. This is a capillary bed that we call a glomerulus. Is made up of fenestrated capillaries. What does that mean? They're super leaky. Super leaky. When the blood has finished going through the glomerulus, everybody's favorite word to misspell, by the way, 
I'm going to come out to do an efferent arterial. E for exiting. And again, I'm an arterial. blood vessel continues by wrapping itself around the nephron. Is, yep. that, is that afferent arterial coming in or going out? Afferent is going in. Okay. Efferent is exiting. Okay. Wait, how, how do you spell the glomerulin? Glomerulin. Hang on. I'm going to fill in that little box. Okay? When I finish with the efferent arterial, I, again, a highly technical diagram. I'm going to come around and I'm simply going to wrap around oh, the nephron. These blood vessels are called the peritubular capillaries, which sounds strange, but that's its name. I mean, it's wrapping around the tubular. So it's the peritubular capillaries. And when I finish doing that, I'll find a nice radiating vein. And leave. Okay, so let's finish being a drop of blood going through the kidney. I got to the nephron. Now I know coming off the radiate artery was an afferent. Which broke up into a capillary bed called a glomerulus, which then drains through an efferent arterial, then wraps around as a set of peritubular capillaries. Then I leave. to understanding what's going to happen is to realize we've got two pathways on the board. I've got the urine pathway that's traveling in the black nephron. I've got the blood pathway that is wrapping around it, but he's in the blood vessels. Okay, i got two roads. I think of it sometimes like 95 and 40. They sort of wrap around each other, but they're distinct pathways. All the characters are on board. Let's see what happens. I can get rid of this list now. Let's see what happens when I talk to myself. Yes. Urine formation is going to happen in three steps. The first step in urine formation filtration. Remember filtration from God knows when and anything on, but it means there's a lot of pressure and we're pushing fluid through a membrane. Filtration is going to happen when we move things from the bloodstream into the urine. It happens right here. moving from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. That is filtration. Filtration happens when we move from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. Filtration is passive except that we have to have a lot of pressure in the glomerulus and it pushes things through those leaky capillaries into the urine. The same thing as um, diffusion? No, because there's a force on it. Diffusion is random going back and forth to everybody's agreement. This is more like making coffee in the morning or calling the spaghetti. 
There's a force on one side. And just like spaghetti, the holes in the colander determine that the water comes through, but the spaghetti stays. The holes in the glomerulus, the pores in the glomerulus are about seven nanometers. In diameter. What that means, if anybody remembers trivia of AMP, is that red blood cells can't get out. Okay? Infiltration, the holes in the glomerulus are too small to let red blood cells out. They're also too small to let proteins out. So what's going to get filtered out is going to be waste and nutrients in the form of amino acids, and glucose. And of course, lots of water will come out. All of the